For all the madness of the family court, this topic is one that has been festering under my skin for a very long time, and now I am going to expose what I regularly see. At the heart of this deeply disturbing and potentially corrupt issue are yet again the sick family lawyers who all too often stir the pot of hate and acrimony for financial gain, engage in thousands of pounds in unnecessary work, and have absolutely no duty of care to any child. But this vlog exposes another dark and what I believe is a very sinister side of their practice, which is when they manipulate and potentially even intentionally falsify the content of draft orders. But before I lift the lid on what I see and believe to be outrageous practices, Let's run my excellent introduction. I am Philip Kedge, a retired police chief inspector, and yes, that is me in my younger days. Back then, as a chief inspector, I held various roles. I was a district commander, head of a policy and strategic planning department, a critical incident commander, and spent my last years of service at the Home Office, working as a special project advisor to the Police Minister and what was known back then as National ACPO. I am now the director of the Mackenzie Friend UK Network and founder of the national campaign of hashtag like not hate. In all my videos, my views and opinions are entirely my own. If you are going through family court as a litigant in person, hopefully with one of our independent and trusted Mackenzie friends from the Mackenzie Friends UK network, you need to know two important points when it comes to the drafting of child arrangement orders. Point number one. After any hearing where uh, an order is made, for example, the first hearing dispute resolution appointment, or the second hearing known as the dispute resolution appointment or at a, any fact-finding hearing or final hearing, if the other side is legally represented, the court will ask their lawyer to draft the order. When drafting orders, they have a duty where they must act impartially to assist the court. The drafting of orders therefore carries significant professional responsibility. Point two. This is very important to understand, particularly if you are paying for a family barrister. Misguided people who pay thousands for unnecessary barristers to represent them in family court often believe that the primary responsibility of their barrister is to them as the client. Nothing is further from the truth. A barrister has an overriding duty to the court to act with independence in the interests of justice. He or she must assist the court in the administration of justice and must not deceive or knowingly or recklessly mislead the court. A barrister's duty to the court is an important one, which can override other duties such as the duty to act in the best interests of each client. I am going to repeat that because this could be a bombshell to many of you. A barrister's duty to the court is an important one which can override other duties such as the duty to act in the best interests of each client. So, I often find it very amusing when people hire barristers thinking that they are, they are on their team. Instead, in reality, they are paying thousands of pounds for the barrister to, in effect, assist the court. That's why lazy family court judges like barristers. They help them and make their lives easier. But in this potentially lies a very dark side. How many lawyers may abuse this entitled position of assisting the court in the interests of justice 
especially when it comes to the drafting of orders. I suggest that this could open the door to widespread and institutionalized abuse. Now, when a court requests that a lawyer drafts the court order, the draft order should be sent to the litigant in person on the other side to read and agree before being filed with the court to seal. In layperson terms, the sealing of the order is when the order cannot be changed. It has the court stamp on it and is ready for serving on the parties. However, from my experience and observations in the family court for over a decade, I am going to suggest that only a third of draft orders that I see accurately reflect the true recitals and orders that were either agreed or ordered by the court. In the next one third of cases, I often find troubling changes, discrepancies, mistakes and inaccuracies from what was actually stated in court. Whether or not this is deliberate by the lawyer when drafting the order is hard to tell. But even if it is human error, the discrepancies may in some way change the understanding of the arrangements and this can be very serious. Sometimes a lawyer, when sending the draft order to a litigant in person, may actually in their email openly state that they have added a matter that was not considered by the court for agreement. For example, they may explain that they have added in the draft order the drop-off time of 5 p.m. for agreement as the court did not give clear directions on this. On the one hand, this could be seen as them being transparent and pragmatic, but if it is not agreed, then there is a big problem. The lawyer will need to either remove it or send the draft order back to the court for their clarification. This can cause delays and clogs up the system. However, at least in these circumstances, the lawyer is being transparent. So what about the remaining one third of draft orders that I see? In these cases, it is my opinion that there potentially exists institutionalized corruption in the drafting of orders with significant changes, omissions or additions that in no way resemble the directions of the court and in no way can be simply put down to human error. These potentially have serious implications to contact arrangements and the lawyers appear to be simply manipulating them in the hope that the litigant in person doesn't notice and the court simply seals it, in which case it is almost impossible, certainly incredibly difficult, to then challenge and undo it. Let me provide some potential examples to give this some context. At the hearing, the judge orders that the non-resident parent has overnight contact on a Wednesday to Thursday, as well as every other weekend. This midweek overnight contact was vehemently opposed by the resident parent, because little Johnny has a planned evening activity that night. The lawyer records in the draft order that the non-resident parent has overnight contact, but adds in the recital that the parent will take Johnny to their regular evening activities, something that was never agreed or directed by the court. In a second possible example, the resident parent wants little Johnny home on a Sunday at 4 p.m. The court directs 7 p.m., but the draft order is written as 4 p.m in support of their client. Be warned, I have seen attempts to alter contact dates and times from what was directed by the court. Let's continue with some more possible examples. When it comes to contact centres, the lawyer adds in the recital 
that the costs will be solely that of the non-resident parent, when in court it was actually agreed to be shared. I have also seen handover locations totally change from what was agreed in court. When the litigant in person has to attend a contact centre where it was deemed by the court that contact only needs to be supported, the draft order states that it is now supervised contact. Recently, a father contacted me to explain that the mother was totally opposed to her little Johnny meeting his new girlfriend. The court determined that there should be interim contact on a Saturday. But in the draft order written by the mother's lawyer, the father was furious because it had been added that the child must not meet the girlfriend. He explains this was never directed by the court as a condition of contact. He was clear that this was a complete fabrication and manipulation of the order, but unfortunately he had not spotted it before the order was sealed. And things potentially get even more outrageous. I have come across this a few times in interim contact orders. The lawyer, when drafting the court order, adds a clause in the recitals that the child is to be returned to the resident parent if the child expresses that wish, clearly adding a backdoor clause that enables their client to then manipulate the child in relation to contact. What can I say? It is in my mind both fraudulently manipulating contact orders and showing a complete disregard to the welfare of any child caught in the middle. He will now be exposed to pressures and influence to minimise or even stop contact. It is also very possible that lawyers will draft and submit an order to the court without even sending it first to the litigant in person for checking. Sometimes they send the draft to the litigant in person a few days after submitting it to the court, by which time it's often too late to raise any objections. The other significant problem is that when the court receives these draft orders, they often just assume that they are accurate and have been agreed and then seal them. They put their trust in the lawyer to act independently in assisting the court. But from what I am seeing and hearing, this position is being frequently and systematically abused. So what can you do? These are my essential tips. Firstly, when you are in court as a litigant in person with your McKenzie friend from the McKenzie Friend UK network, we will help you to ensure that the lawyer agrees to sending you the draft order for agreement prior to it being filed with the court. Secondly, as soon as you receive the draft order, review it with your McKenzie friend from the notes taken and check it for accuracy. Take your time, go through it line by line. Thirdly, if there are errors, inaccuracies or omissions, then respond to the lawyer stating clearly that it is not agreed and provide your observations and perspective. Hopefully that will iron out the issues and it can then be filed with agreement. If points are not agreed, then insist that the order is returned to court with the positions of both sides clearly stated for the court to then determine the correct order. So, what happens if you have not had the opportunity to check the draft order and the sealed order arrives with significant discrepancies in it? Well, there is a possible path where you may be able to challenge it with the court. This is in law what is known as the slip rule. This allows for an order to be amended if it contains an accidental slip such as a clerical error, mistake or omission. It is very limited. So if you are in this situation, please contact me 
at contactphil.co.uk. Lastly, if you are in a situation where you believe that the lawyer has intentionally falsified and manipulated the draft order, then complain. Write to the court and complain. If it is a solicitor, also complain to the solicitor's regulatory authority. If it is a barrister, complain to the Bar Standards Board. At the next hearing, complain again, and if it is the same lawyer, state that you don't accept them drafting the order and request that the judge or magistrates write it themselves as they should, in my opinion, anyway. Complain, complain and complain. It's time to hold such disgraceful and even possibly corrupt lawyers to account. Once again, on different levels, this manipulation of draft orders is common and I believe institutionalized behavior. Let's leave it there. And I hope that this has been helpful and eye-opening. I would like to invite you to join the campaign of hashtag like not hate and the litigant and person army that is swelling in numbers every day supporting the campaign. You don't have to be alone going through the broken, inept and incomprehensible family court system. The campaign of hashtag like not hate has three core aims. Aim number one, to remove family lawyers from the family court. Currently 50% of family court service users are litigants in person. It is my aim to increase this to 80% by 2025. How? It's very easy. Join the litigant in person army and educate others to stop hiring them. You don't need lawyers in the family court. Family court lawyers have absolutely no duty of care to any child and it is within our hands to remove them from the courts and to change the family court forever. Aim number two. To challenge and change the family court from the inside. This has never been done before. Imagine an army of litigants in person already with access to the family courts to appropriately and intelligently challenge the family court from the inside, all with one voice and clear messages. If you want an example, then watch my vlog on how to challenge Kafkas and hold them to account. Listen carefully on how I suggest that we as litigants in person can challenge the CAFCAS Section 7 reports. With these messages, we can reach out to the tens of thousands of litigants in person and unite them. The third aim is to take a stand against spurious allegations of abuse and coercive control, motivated by hate, revenge and hurt feelings. To challenge the manipulation of the family courts and the weaponising of children fueled by acrimony with the intention of reducing, minimising or denying contact, punishing the other parent. Spurious allegations based on hate are now flooding uncontrollably into the family courts, which is failing to get a grip on the issue and by not doing so is itself causing unmeasurable harm to relationships and destroying childhoods. The pendulum has to swing back to applying common sense, where the emphasis needs to be on a solutions-based approach to promote contact and not stopping contact on the back of spurious and vindictive allegations against the non-resident parent. This is your opportunity to have a voice and to help reach out to the army of litigants in person who are going through the family courts so that we can be united in our voice and support. Join today at www.lightnothate.co.uk.